Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest webinar from Omdia, a division of InformaTech. My name is Alan Tatara, Senior Event Manager for the Omdia webinar team, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Today's webinar is Segment Routing in the 5G Era. Network operators are turning to segment routing to help manage the challenges of delivering 5G and multi-cloud services. Today, our panel will explore the latest advances in segment routing and dive into successful use cases for the 5G era. Our webinar is co-presented by Omdia and our partner, Juniper Networks. Before we get started, let me highlight just some of the features that are available for you on the webinar. So the console that you're looking at is completely customizable. You can open, close, move, or resize any of the windows that you have open on your screen and arrange the console as you like. At the bottom of your console, you're going to see a number of application widgets. I do want to mention the resource list widget, and this is very important because this is where you will find additional material about our topic, including the downloadable slide deck from today's session, as well as other valuable information, including a special report authored by analyst Heidi Adams. So make sure you check this out during the webinar. You're also going to see a Twitter widget, which means you can tweet directly from within the console. And today we're using the hashtag segment routing. We will also have a live Q&A session directly after our presentation. So please submit your questions or comments at any time by using that Q&A box that is on the left side of your screen. Note that this webinar is being recorded and that the on-demand version will be sent out to you within about 24 hours. And if you experience any technical issues whatsoever, just click on that little question mark widget and you will get the answers that you seek. So now let me introduce our panel. First leading our discussion is Heidi Adams. Heidi is an executive director in the network infrastructure research segment at Omdia. And rounding out our panel, we have Ron Bonica. Ron is a distinguished engineer at Juniper Networks. So welcome to both Heidi and Ron. It is great having you with us today. So Heidi, let me now turn the controls over to you so we can get started. All right, thank you, Alan, and a warm welcome to everyone joining us for our webinar today. As I'll mention, over the next hour, we're going to be digging into the evolution of IP networks, and in particular, how segment routing is a key technology for enabling service providers and other network operators to support new and emerging 5G services in a more efficient and robust manner. From the agenda point of view today, I'll start off setting a little bit of context and sharing some Omdia research in this area. I'll then turn it over to Ron Bonica from Juniper to walk us through the latest challenges driving the evolution of segment routing and how different variations and implementations of this technology can be applied to different network operator environments. And we'll also have a few use case examples as well. At the end of the session, as I mentioned, we'll save some time for Q&A, so if you have any questions, please do enter them into the Q&A interface. We'll get to them at the end of the presentation. So with that, let's get started on our presentation today, um, starting off with a quick look at the overall spectrum of emerging 5G services and how they're driving new requirements onto, onto the underlying transport networks. Diagram here is from the 5G Americas team, and to me it really nicely summarizes the scope of opportunity for services enabled by 5G infrastructure. Key here, if you look at the y-axis over on the left-hand side of the chart, is really um, faster speeds, more connected devices, and a need for deterministic latency and reliability. So these are sort of the, the, the foundation of emerging services based on 5G. Many of the services indicated in the bubbles in the center of the chart can be supported by 4G LT today, but in general, not at the speeds, the scale, or the efficiency of 5G. So 5G really becomes a technical and a commercial enabler for many of these services to really take off. So next, if we want to look at mapping the service requirements to the underlying IP network, we see five, three key areas and three main areas for network evolution. So first off, extreme mobile broadband services driving a requirement for more network capacity, and we've got rule of thumb. We can expect around 10x data plane scale moving forward. Um, second piece with respect to uh, massive scale communications, Internet of Things, this is going to drive some additional traffic, but more importantly, the need to connect more and more endpoints, more and more end devices. Some of those will be transactional, some of those will be stateful, all are going to lead to a requirement for increased control control plane scale within the network. And then the third piece, ultra reliable low latency services. This drives more service level agreement or SLA requirements onto the network. Um, looking at 
Um, a big chunk of this is playing to the larger enterprise or inter industry focus we're seeing for 5G, and this drives the need for the network to more easily and efficiently support quality of service, meet those SLA requirements, and this is kind of where we see the introduction of network slices as well. So let's map this to a few IP network evolution trends. Three key areas of focus emerge. The first is the ongoing need to add more scale, more network capacity, and we're seeing increases in the access, metro, and core. All are also supporting the need to deliver lower cost per bit. Okay, so we have this addressed in a couple of different ways. First off, through the introduction of successive generations of routing technology. Um, for example, seeing the migration from one gig to 10 gig in the access towards 25 and 100 gig in backhaul networks. And now this year starting to move towards 400 gig in the core. But scale is not only network capacity, but it's also that ability to meet a massive increase in the number of endpoints and connected devices. In the middle, I have the need for more control. And really this is using control as a tool to more easily support increased reliability in the network. This manifests in how we deploy, manage, and assure deterministic latency or guaranteed bandwidth within the network. And a key piece of guaranteeing service is to, of course, be able to quickly reroute that traffic in the event of a failure. So really providing um, a very resilient network. This does also go beyond just control. Automation is a critical element in here as well. And finally, more efficiency is this third area. How do we do everything better, more efficiently, more cheaply? Um, resource optimization is one path. Simplifying network protocols, equipment, and architectures is another. So IP network evolution is underway. These are three of the key areas. And segment routing and IP networks is a key technology for supporting these requirements. All right, so what is segment routing and why is it important? Um, there are a lot of technical descriptions for segment routing out there. If you Google segment routing, that mostly describe how it works, but I'll see if I can put it in a little bit more layman's terms. Um, segment routing is yet another routing protocol or protocol enhancement. It's based on a technique called source space routing, which has been around for a long time, and it can be partnered up with some new, newer tools, such as centralized SDN control and path computation in particular um, to support simpler IP network architectures, a more viable approach to doing traffic engineering, which is key for delivering SLA-based services, and provides more ways to add resiliency into the network. And all of these characteristics are key to delivering the 5G services that we described earlier. All right, so in 2018 timeframe, so this was a little while ago, but as segment routing was really starting to take off, we have conducted a custom service provider survey to better understand what network operators found attractive about segment routing and what they thought would be the key use cases and driver for introduction of the technology into their networks. Um, traffic TE or traffic engineering came out as the top use case. 80% of our respondents cited it as being very important. Um, what is traffic engineering? Simply the ability to exercise control on how IP traffic crosses the network. You've got the ability to route traffic based on different criteria, not just the shortest path, but maybe a path that meets specific criteria such as available bandwidth, cost, physical diversity, geographic consideration. So key to being able to steer traffic across the network. Associated with this, of course, uh, the number two um, top driver here was simplified provisioning. Not surprising because that's closely aligned with group traffic engineering as well. So how real is segment routing today? How widely deployed is it? So I'll have a look at this chart a little bit from the right to the left. Um, segment routing, if you think about it, it's, it's something a little bit more under the hood. It's not something you shout from the rooftops in the way that turning on new 5G services you know, gets the attention from press release point of view. But instead, I think safe to assume at this point, planning and deployment has been quietly and steadily progressing in the background for several years at this point. So looking at the far right-hand side of the chart, why was segment routing deployed in networks for those who have deployed it today? Um, I've got here a list of some highlights from um, public announcements that were made by network operators with respect to key rationale for why they chose to implement it in their networks. So we see um, improving network scalability, reducing CapEx and OpEx, improving network availability, supporting SLAs and network splicing, and again, by extension, being able to offer differentiated value add 5G and connectivity services. In the middle of the chart, you can see logos of network operators. 
um, who have publicly announced or indicated their deployments. And finally, on the far right, from the small custom survey of IP network architects and planners, key takeaway, segment routing is well on the radar. It's been deployed in many networks. All of our surveyed operators had plans to implement segment routing at some point in the future, if not already. So finally, where to from here, and what are we going to hear on the balance of the webinar today? Um, we have just heard segment routing is well established. And to highlight, the initial flavor of segment routing is SRMPLS, so based on an MPLS forwarding plane. However, the industry continues to evolve into an ENT and broaden the applicability of segment routing into different networks and for different applications. So what are these new variants and approaches? Where would they be used? What challenges are they solving? And how do I, as a network operator, decide which approach is going to be the best for meeting my service and network objectives? And for that, I'd like to ask Ron to join and share some of his insights, starting with a view on current challenges that the SR community is working to address. So Ron, over to you. OK, good morning. Thanks for having me. Let's start out by talking about 5G networks and what makes them so different from 4G networks. And to examine this, I think we should start by looking at the users. The first observation is that there are so many of them. Um, right now, there are 7.6 billion people on the, on the planet. And by the time we're done with 5G deployment, a good percentage of those, well into the billions, will have 5G devices with them all day long. Um, now, the next question is, what are they doing with those devices? Well, they're uh, using some, some applications that both operate at high data rates and have very stringent SLAs. Now, when I wrote this slide a few weeks ago, um, I had very frivolous things in mind. You know, I had them you know, thinking of them playing video games and uh, chasing Pokemon. Well, today, I'm thinking about them doing telemedicine. Um, I'm thinking about them staying in touch while, uh, while their states or their whole countries might be in lockdown. So these stringent, LSA, uh, these stringent SLAs are very important things. Now, let's talk about um, the 5G technology a little bit. Because 5G supports such high bandwidth, the end user device is very close to the network edge device. Because of that, there will be many, many edge devices. This is what, uh, you know, one of the things that drives a need for change in network protocols. When you have many, many, many edge devices, you need something that scales well. The other thing is you need something that is fairly easy to operate. Um, you now have many, many more devices, but you still have to operate it with the same resources. Um, you still have to deal with network management systems and controllers. You still have to be able to uh, debug it when it breaks at 2 o'clock in the morning. So, you know, the 5G challenge is really fairly significant. The next thing I'd like to do is take a look at the 5G customer profile. I'm not talking about the end user, the guy in the picture here. I'm talking about you folks, the folks who are deploying 5G. And it turns out you're a very heterogeneous bunch. Um, you're, you're not all the same. Some of you have very detailed fine-grained traffic engineering requirements. You need to reserve bandwidth. You're running links hot. Uh, you need to understand a full matrix of uh, of SR paths between every edge and every other edge. Some of you, not so much. You have coarse grain uh, traffic engineering requirements. Um, your traffic engineering requirements are more like, most of my traffic should take the IGP least cost path, just keep the big flows off the small links. Um, another difference among you is, um, what are your uh, fast reroute requirements? For some of you, your network domains are small enough that IGP convergence is fast enough to meet your SLAs, and you don't really need fast reroute. For others of you, your, your IGP convergence isn't fast enough because of the network design, because of the network size, and fast reroute is absolutely essential. And then the third uh, difference among you 
is what kind of um, networks you're building on. Are you building on networks that are MPLS aware? Or are you building on networks that are IPv6 aware? Uh, can you deal with the MPLS uh, flavor of segment routing, or do you need an IPv6 flavor? All right, so I'm just going to jump in and ask the audience a quick question before we go forward. And I'm really curious for those of you in the audience, especially those of you who are involved with network operations, um, what is your status with respect to segment routing today? So do you have you already deployed it in your network somewhere? Uh, maybe you haven't deployed it, but you are planning to by the end of this year. Or maybe you're planning to by the end of 2022, so a couple of years out. Or maybe you think you will, but you're not sure when. Um, perhaps you're currently assessing it, but you haven't decided to deploy it, or maybe you don't have any plans at all. So I'm curious, please select one of these. Let's do a live uh, poll and see from an audience perspective where we're at. We'll give you a three, two, one. All right, let's see what the results are. All right, so it is a little bit of a mix. So we've got about 14% who have already deployed. We've got a few more, about 5% planning to deploy by the end of this year. And Perhaps some of that has been slowed down given everything else going on in the environment today. 20% so a sizable amount planning within two years to deploy. And we've got almost a quarter thinking um, you will deploy but not sure of when. So quite interesting and thank you for sharing that. So let's flip over. I'm going to have Ron talk through some of the new options and solutions, some of the new um, variants of segment routing that are emerging today. Ron? Okay. Well, segment routing isn't a one-size-fits-all affair. Um, there are multiple traffic engineering options. There are fast reroute cap capabilities that can be turned on or not. In fact, there are different, uh, uh, and there are also uh, multiple uh, instantiations of segment routing over uh, MPLS or over IPv6 forwarding planes. So before we start, Let's have a little 101 um, overview of segment routing for those of you who are fairly new to it. On the right, we have, uh, and these are just a few terms we're going to need to play the game. On the right, we have a picture of an SR domain, and an SR domain is a bunch of SR aware routers. Um, in the domain, nodes play different uh, roles. We have an ingress node, an egress node, and some transit nodes. The important thing is we have this concept of an SR path. An SR path is a path that uh, provides connectivity from the ingress to the egress. It can either take the least cost path or any other path if it needs to be traffic engineered. Um, the path contains segments, and there are different kinds of segments. Um, a prefix segment can contain two hops. An adjacency segment contains one hops, one hop. Um, there were other kinds of segments that we won't uh, dive deeply into today. But the important thing about segment routing is that when the ingress node gets a packet, it prepends an SR header to it. And depending on whether it's SR MPLS or SR IP, it's a different kind of header. But the important thing about that header is it has information that identifies every segment endpoint. So, the path information is encoded in each packet. This relieves the transit nodes of the responsibility of maintaining per path information. So if the transit nodes don't have to maintain per path information, you don't need a special protocol to distribute per path information. That means you can turn off LDP, you can turn off RSVPT, uh, RSVP TE, and this is a source of your simplicity. For the most part, SR can run with just an IGP. There are some extensions to ISIS. There are some extensions to OSPF. And um, that's just about all you need for SR. And as I mentioned before, there are um, many instantiations of SR, SR MPLS, where that um, SR header is an MPLS label stack. There's also, also SRV6 and SRM6, where the SR header is an IPv6 header followed by a routing header. The difference between SRV6 and SRM6 is the routing header type. So let's talk a little bit about multiple traffic engi uh, engineering options. 
And first, let's talk about coarse-grained um, traffic engineering. Let's say your traffic engineering policy is fairly simple. Let's say you have 100 gig and 10 gig links in your network, and you also have small, medium, and large flows. Your traffic engineering uh, policy is just that you want the small flows to take the IGP shortest path, the low latency path. You want the large flows to take the shortest path but exclude the 10 gig links if possible. And the absolutely largest uh, flows you want to uh, stay away from the 10 gig links at all costs, you know, drop the flow rather than tra traverse the 10 gig link. Well, there's something called Flex Algo that supports that. And we'll talk about that in detail a little bit later on. Now, that's a fairly coarse-grained um, traffic engineering requirement. You'll notice that every ingress node has exactly the same policy. Well, sometimes you have more fine-grained um, policies. For instance, let's say you have a flow from New York to Chicago. It has certain requirements in terms of latency and bandwidth reservations. You have another one from St. Louis to Los Angeles, it has different requirements. Well, in that case, we have a more fine-grained um, approach called SRTE, uh, Segment Routing for Traffic Engineering. In some ways, it is very similar to what we're used to in RSVPTE. Every uh, SR path is given constraints and uh, links are given attributes and paths are computed to so that every path goes only over links that can support it. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later too. You'll also find there's a big difference here between SRTE and RSVPTE. If your um, TE policy requires bandwidth reservations, in the old world of RSVPTE, um, every transit node kept track of ba uh, bandwidth reservations that it uh, supported. Well, in segment routing, you've taken per path state out of the network. So if you have that kind of uh, um, traffic engineering policy, you're going to need a centralized controller. Now we'll get into this more. Sometimes you can uh, deploy SRTE and you don't need a centralized controller. For instance, if your policy doesn't involve bandwidth reservations. But if it does involve bandwidth reservations, you're going to need a centralized controller. Now, let's talk about fast reroute capabilities. Um, let's say for a minute you have no fast reroute capabilities and a link or a node goes down in your network. Um, when that happens, the nodes that are adjacent to the link that went down will detect the, uh, detect the outage and flood the information into the IGP. Every node's IGP will converge at a different time, and during that convergence period, there'll be some black holing. Some packets will be lost until all the network, uh, all the nodes converge on the new network topology. How long will that be? Well, that depends on the size and the configuration of your network. It might be milliseconds, it might be seconds, and some networks it might even be tens of seconds. Um, that may or may not be sufficient to meet your uh, SLA. So we have this concept in segment routing of fast reroute where you have a point of local repair. When it's protecting a link or a node, um, for every destination, it finds a repair node, a node to which it would send traffic if the protected link went down. It then pre-computes a tunnel to that node and when the link goes down, it sends, it sends traffic to that tunnel. It continues to send traffic to that tunnel until the IGP reconverges, at which point the tunnel becomes the backup route again and a new primary comes in. Now, there have been attempts to um, do this sort of thing before. Uh, they've been called LFA, link-free link alternates, and RLFA, remote link-free alternates. Those gave you pretty good coverage, but not 100% coverage. 
In the world of segment routing, we have something called TILFA that gives you 100% coverage. No matter what your network topology, no matter what link goes down, you will be covered by a repair tunnel. Finally, there are three MPLS forwarding planes. Um, there are some, com some things that are common about all of them. Um, well, first, let's talk about what they are. SRM6, SRV6, and SRMPLS. Um, what's common about them is they all steer a packet from segment to segment along an SR path uh, using, uh, well, there's a bug in the slide, using a uh, routing header. Uh, um, and they all execute an instruction at each segment endpoint. Now, by far the most common is SRMPLS. It encodes the SR path and an MPLS label stack, and each entry is encoded uh, as a uh, each segment is encoded as an MPLS label stack entry. You know, each segment is uh, costs 32 bits in this header. Um, the next two are IPv6 enabled. So let's talk about SRV6 next. Uh, an SRV6 path information is in, uh, encoded in an IPv6 routing header called a segment routing header. And here, each segment looks like an IPv6 address. So it's 128 bits long. And instructions are encoded in that uh, IPv6 address. Um, there's an alternative to that called SRM6. In SRM6, um, again, the path is in encoded in a routing header, this time called a compressed routing header. The difference is each segment is encoded in either 16 or 32 bits. Um, and we'll, we'll dive a little more deeply into SRV6 and SRM6 in a second. Okay, well actually, I guess we'll dive into it right now. Um, this is a look at the SRV6 header. Um, we have a payload of 512 bytes. Um, we're assuming that the header has, I think this one has seven segments in it. So the uh, segment routing header is uh, 120 bytes, and the IPv6 header is uh, 40 bytes. So you see that the header is fairly large. Um, you know, we're talking about 160 bytes for 520 bytes of payload. And here's a blow up of what the, uh, on the right is a blow up of what the header looks like. And here we compare it to the SRM6 header. Again, it's um, seven segments in the header, but the difference is each segment costs only two bytes. So the um, CRH is much shorter than the SRH. All right. And so Heidi? Yeah, thanks, Ron. So with that, I'll just hop into another opportunity to reach out to the audience and just get a little bit of feedback from you. So we've talked about a few concepts and a few of the use cases. I'd like to hear from you which of the following you consider to be important use cases, and feel free to select all that apply. Um, so we've talked about fine grain traffic engineering. Is that important? Coarse grain traffic engineering, uh, network resiliency, maybe the leverage of fast reroute. Um, in your network, is it important to be able to support both IPv4 and IPv6 data planes or support for IPv6 only data plane? Um, or maybe there's some other use cases. So um, please take a second, let us know which one of these are important for you in your network. And let's have a look at the results. Wow, okay, wow, we have a winner. <laughs> Not that this was really a contest, but network resiliency and the ability to implement fast reroute by far number one. 87.5% of respondents said that that was an important one. Uh, traffic engineering, both variants also very important. And it looks like in terms of where we're at on being able to support a, a dual stack or a mixed IPv4 or IPv6 seems to be the more um, predominant approach versus IPv6 only. So very good feedback. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, so with that, let's move over into the next section. I'm gonna have Ron reach, uh, share a few deployment applications, leveraging some of those solutions we just explored. So Ron, back over to you.
Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, coarse-grained TE, and we'll talk about FlexAlgo. Here's an example. Um, let's say for a minute we have a network with 100 gig and 10 gig um, links. In fact, that's the network on the right. And in this network, we have three kinds of flows. We have mouse flows, uh, medium size flows, so I guess they're horse flows, and very large flows called elephant flows. Well, a mouse flow, you would like very much to take the um, low latency path. So when the mouse flow is going from node A to node D, much better that it goes over the 10 gig link because the latency is going to be much, uh, much smaller. So what we do in um, FlexAlgo is we have a network topology, and we're going to build three views of it called algos. Um, the algo that is appropriate for the mouse flows looks pretty much like the network topology. All the links in it are present, and the metric that we use is equal to the circuit mileage. Uh, it's also a function of you know, the circuit mileage is generally uh, what determines latency across a link. Now we're going to take a look at a medium flow. The medium flow, we're starting to worry about congestion. Uh, this flow might be a gig or two. You'd really like to keep it off that 10 gig link because you don't want to drive it into congestion. But if, say, the link between A and B and the link between A and C are both down and you have no choice to put it other than to put it over that 10 gig link, yeah, go ahead and do it. So in this algo, we use a different um, metric between node A and node B. Uh, in the last slide, the metric was 100. and this one, it is 300. So generally speaking, when all the links are up, traffic from node A to node D will uh, take one of, uh, either go through B or C, taking the longer path. But when they link A, a, B, and A, C are both down, then a medium flow will go over that 10 gig link. Now let's take a look at an elephant flow. An elephant flow is larger than the 10 gig link. Even if you did put traffic over that 10 gig link, um, the elephant flow still wouldn't get through. So in this view, we have um, that 10 gig link just isn't even there. If you lose node AB and node um, uh, uh, link AB and link uh, AC, the elephant flow is just going to stop because it has no path. <clears throat> now, let's take a look at uh, fine grain traffic engineering with a controller. Here, what happens is um, when the network operator configures the network, he associates uh, attributes with each link. Uh, what's its bandwidth? What's its uh, administrative color? Uh, mil million attributes. And generally, using a protocol like BGPLS, all, well, well, first, all those attributes will be flooded into the IGP domain using the IGP. But using a protocol like BGPLS, all of that, all of those attributes will be um, sent up to a controller. Um, here we use North Star because that's the controller that uh, Juniper produces. In any event, the next thing that happens is a network operator enters the traffic engineering policy into North Star. He might say something like, I need a link from R1 to R9, and it may only traverse blue link. Uh, blue links. I'm sorry, I need a path from R1 to R9, and it can only traverse blue links. I need another one from R3 to R4. It can traverse blue and red. And I need another one from R2 to R8, but it can't traverse more than two hops. In any event, there's something on North Star called a path computation element. It will find um, a path for each of uh, those. It'll compute a path for each and send it back down to the nodes. 
So each node will be configured with um, a path that satisfies its constraints. Here, one of the constraints that you know we can handle because there's a central controller as a bandwidth reservation. Let's say um, some of these uh, SR paths reserve some amount of bandwidth. The controller has a global view of how much bandwidth is reserved at each node, so it can do this. Um, the interesting thing is the controller is sending down a bunch of segment endpoints. Those segment endpoints can either be represented as um, uh, MPLS label stack entries, if we're using SR MPLS, or they can be represented as um, a segment identifiers if we're using SRV6, or they can be represented as um, SIDs if we're using SRM6. Now, let's talk a little bit about, let's go back a second, and let's talk about fast reroute with TILFA. Here's an example. Um, let's say for a minute traffic is going from the uh, unlabeled node on the far left to R10. R3 is trying to protect against a node failure at R6. So what does R3 do? Well, normally the traffic would go from R3 to R6 to R10. That's if R6 weren't failing. Before there's any failure, R3 has to calculate a, a path that it would use if R6 failed. Now, the first thing it has to do is find a repair node. A repair node is a node to which it could send traffic um, and know that that node has a path to R10, the ultimate destination, that would not pass through R6 of any of it or any of its links. So R3 can't just send the packet on to R10, uh, to R4, because R4 would send it back to R3. That wouldn't help very much. So in this case, R3 picks R9 as the repair node, because if it can get the packet to R9, um, R9 will always have a good path uh, to R10. Now, how does it get the packet to R9? Well, it can't just put it in the GRE tunnel headed for R9, because if it did that, it would send it off to R4, and R4 would send it back to R3. That wouldn't help very much, because R4's best path to um, R9 is through R3. Um, so what it does is creates a uh, SR path going to R9. And the SR path really contains three segments. There's a prefix segment that gets the packet as far as R5. Then the hard part is getting the packet across link R5, R7, the one with the high IGP metric. So there's an adjacency segment that forces it from there. And then finally, a prefix segment gets it to R9. Um, the only reason this gives you 100% coverage is because the repair tunnel is an SR, uh, um, an SR MPLS tunnel. And it's because it can take a path other than the IGP least cost path, because there is no IGP least cost path to R9 that wouldn't go through R6. I know that's a bit complicated. Um, for more details on this, I've got a blog on TILFA that you can look at uh, later on. All right, thank you, Rowan. So with that, I'd actually like to give you an opportunity to share a little bit about Juniper's work in the segment routing domain and some of the solutions you guys have and are bringing to market. So, Rowan? Okay. Um, Juniper has invested very heavily in uh, segment routing. First, we have a, um, a feature-rich feature SR stack with things like interworking with LDP, RSVP. Um, uh, SRV6 is uh, coming soon, uh, as is SRM6. We have a North Star controller 
which you know we'd like to tout as being the strongest controller in the network uh, in the uh, in the industry now. And we've also got innovations going on around SRMPLS, uh, SRM6, FlexAlgo, TILFA. Um, we have many production pilots going on, especially with our innovative stuff like SRM6 and FlexAlgo. Another thing we'll find is streaming telemetry is very, very important. Um, once upon a time, to, to manage a network, you would go pull network elements and find out how things are doing. Well, it turns out that's highly inefficient. We have uh, this concept of streaming telemetry, so the network element will just push uh, telemetry out to the network management station, and it can, it can diagnose faults uh, as it does. The other is we have a, uh, a deep label stack. Um, back in the early days of SR, uh, SRMPLS, everybody had a problem because you could only push so many labels at, uh, at a time. We've overcome that problem, and now I, I believe we can uh, push a label stack as deep as anybody. We also have um, many places where you can go for more information. Um, a good index can be found at www.juniper.net slash sr. There you'll find um, some, some good links to other information. In, in fact, um, a minute ago I made a reference to a blog on TILFA. You'll find it at that page. You'll also find blogs on other SR topics. Um, there are some good day one books that you can find at Juniper's site, and also some videos on um, this topic or that in uh, segment routing. All right. Thank you, Ron. So just a quick reminder to the audience, if you have some questions on anything you've heard discussed today, please do enter them into the Q&A console. We're almost at that point in the program. And just to wrap it up, let me just share a couple of key takeaways for you folks. Um, first off, um, hopefully you take away that segment routing today is a mature and widely deployed technology for IP networks. So it is well established. It is out there. And many of you in the audience have actually already deployed this into your networks. Second off, segment routing, we believe it is well suited to meet some of the key requirements of new emerging services, including 5G and some of the special services within 5G, especially with respect to um, latency, low latency services and highly available, highly reliable services. Um, third off, also key takeaway, continued innovation and investment in segment routing is bringing more features, more flexibility, more applicability for this technology into networks, and that's enabling network operators to meet a wider variety of network and service objectives. So with that, I'd like to transition over to the Q&A section. Again, don't forget to ask your questions. And we've got several of them from the audience um, and really quite a range. So some of them are a little higher level, some that are much more technical and in the weeds. And what I'll try and do is start at the high level and then work our way down to some of the more technical questions. Um, so first off, there was a there was a question that was asking um, about the use of um, within network operators, sort of is there a preference towards the use of SRMPLS versus SR over an IPv6 data plane? And I think we saw a little bit of the answer to that question just amongst um, the attendees today in terms of the preferences. But I'm wondering, Ron, are you able to share some insights with respect to your engagement with customers on where people are at? Is the vast majority still? Um, NPLS data plane, or are you starting to see increased interest in uh, IPv6 as a data plane? Well, this is a gross number, um, you know, no, gross, gross in the sense that it's a, a rough estimate from a poll that we took. But we find about 80% are interested in SRMPLS only. Of the 20% that are left, some have um, IPv6 only forwarding planes and they find that they still want to run SRMPLS over, SR, uh, over IPv6, and that can be done. Um, we call that uh, SR over 6, and of the 20%, I forget exactly what the number is, but you know, maybe 6, 8% are interested in that. The rest are a split between SRv6 and SRm6. 
Um, and the, the big difference between SRV6 and SRM6, first is um, the ability to do fine-grained traffic engineering. <coughs> um, both SRV6 and SRM6 rely on a IPv6 routing header. If the SR path contains many, many segments, the SRV6 routing header gets very long. In fact, it can become so long that it becomes a significant consumer of bandwidth. So the people who are interested in having paths with many segments go towards SRM6. Another difference between SRV6 and SRM6 is the number of lookups that's required to process the packet. Uh, SRM6 has a shorter header, but it does one more lookup. Well, it turns out that on our platform, we can still forward on Lightspeed, so the user doesn't notice the lookup. Um, and I guess a third difference between SRV6 and SRM6 is the use of the IPv6 address. In SRV6, an instruction is encoded in the low order bits of the IPv6 address. Because you've changed the semantic of an IPv6 address, there's some OAM stuff that you need to go along with SRV6. In SRM6, an IPv6 is an IP address as an IPv6 address, so you don't need any additional OAM. Anyhow, that's probably more than you wanted to hear about the topic, but. <laughs> no, that's great. All right, well, let's, uh, let's talk next about where in the network uh, segment round may be deployed. So is it primarily in the access network or in the core network? Would it go end to end? Like where are you seeing um, this technology being deployed in networks? All three. Um, again, users are a heterogeneous bunch. Some of them are doing it only in the core. Some are doing it in the core and the access network. Um, but they are three different uh, SR domains. Sometimes the core and the access network and their interworking domains. All right. Um, and then maybe even related to that, can you comment a little bit specifically on mobile transport networks, looking at front hall, mid hall, back hall? Do you see deployment of SR in any of those particular use cases? In back hall, yes. All right. And then uh, we had one other kind of related question that talked about application. So clearly, based on our discussion today, segment routing is very applicable in wide area networks. Do you also see use cases for segment routing within the data center? I see some limited use cases. Um, in a data center, there are there are fewer traffic engineering uh, requirements because in the data center, the topology is you know, so stylized. There's something called a close topology. Um, it's kind of an upside down tree folded over that everyone uses. And because of that, there were really relative, relatively few um, traffic, en well, it's not that there were few traffic engineering options. SR paths are never longer than two hops in the in the data center, and things like um, Flex Algo would just not you know not not be needed in the uh, data center. It would it would be more a a fine grain and once in a while, but really it's it's a different world in the data center. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's move uh, a little bit into implementation and uh, I'll, I'll ask you a few questions around that, hopefully starting with higher level and then getting a little bit more into the weeds. Um, so there was a question, can segment routing be deployed purely with centralized control? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, um, <laughs> and in fact, there, there are two flavors of centralized control. Um, and um, I'd actually want to put the question back to the questioner. One flavor is you're running an IGP and you are running BGP LS to do, um, uh, to tell the controller what the IGP topology looks like. And the controller is doing all your path computation. Absolutely, that can be done. And, you know, that's the North Star uh, story. 
Another thing that the questioner might have meant is, could you have a white box where you're not running any routing protocols at all down on um, uh, down on the network elements? All of all of your path comp, not only all of your path computation, but all of your routing protocols are happening up on the controller, and you're pushing down the entire fib and uh, and yes, theoretically, it could be done. Um, some of the big guys are, uh, you know, the hyperscale um, uh, hyperscalers are talking about that. It's a um, to do that kind of white box deployment is very ambitious. Right. Okay. Um, let's say I've got a, another question that talks perhaps a little bit to standards. And the question is, is segment routing specific from one vendor to another, or is there interoperability between vendors? Oh, absolutely. It's interoperable. Um, um, we've demonstrated interoperability among you know, Juniper, Cisco, Nokia, some others. Um, for SRMPLS, and just recently uh, there was an interoperability event uh, for SRV6. So and yes, it absolutely is. On. And I can also add on to that uh, at the annual uh, MPLS SDN World Congress, there generally is an ENTC, uh, sort of an external third uh, impartial test um, type of uh, company that, that does do interoperability plug fast and every year um, we've seen all the key router vendors participate in that and you know work through the standards and, and ensure we are seeing the interoperability on that side so um, yeah, definitely yeah. going down that path yeah okay yeah, 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 um, and NTC's yeah. report should be out pretty soon yeah okay excellent um, are there any challenges on implementing segment routing in existing networks so brownfield type scenarios. Okay, coexistence is interesting, and particularly coexistence when both SR and RSVPTE both want to make bandwidth reservations. The problem is that they're ships in the night. They don't, you know, one doesn't know how much bandwidth has been uh, allocated by another, and um, one approach to that is actually documented on that uh, Juniper web page that I just uh, pointed out a little while ago. You'll find a white, uh, well, you'll find an RFC um, on coexistence between RSVPTE and SR. All right. Okay, I've got a couple of more technical questions for you. So the first one in Juniper Flex Algo implementation, how do you make a router calculate? the path delay and set it as a metric. Okay, in our case, um, when you define a flex algo, um, you give, well, okay, when you, when you define a link, you give it three metrics, um, an IGP metric, a delay metric, and so what was the other one? It'll come back to me in a second. You give it three metrics. Um, then when you define a flex algo, you tell it which of the metrics it will use. So in the example we just used, we had a delay metric and a, um, uh, an IGP metric. Um, the the small flow used the delay metric and the medium flow used the IGP metric. Now, the next question is, how does the delay metric get, um, uh, get discovered? Well, there are actually two ways to do it. Um, one way is to discover it in real time. Um, you know, things like BFD would discover it. Another is to manually configure it if you don't have, don't have BFD. Okay, um, 
let me see. I think there are a few additional questions. Some of them are a little bit more technical, and I'll leave that to the Juniper team to uh, get back to you guys directly with some answers. And with that, I'm going to wrap up our session today. So thank you so much to Ron um, and Juniper for uh, sharing some background and some more information with respect to segment routing and some of the evolutions that are coming to market. And thank you to the audience for attending. So I'll hand back over to Alan to wrap us up. Thank you, Heidi. I would also like to thank everyone for participating on our webinar today and for submitting all your comments and questions. As Heidi mentioned, our panel will get back to you to answer those questions that we just did not get a chance to do. I also want to thank Heidi for leading our discussion today and also Ron for your very in-depth discussion and sharing your expertise with us as well. The on-demand version of this webinar will be made available shortly. We'll be sending out a link, a follow-up email on how to access that archive, or you can simply use that same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Again, feel free to come back, view this session again, or even pass it along to your colleagues. We're gonna see a short survey pop up at the conclusion of this webinar. We'd love to get your feedback, so please take a few moments to fill that out. And also continue to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for information on future webinars from Omdia, brought to you by Informatech. So again, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.